Hello and welcome to the first video lecture for our online calculus course. Uh, today what I want to talk to you about is the real number line and real numbers themselves. And really, no conversation about this could start without talking about the difference between real numbers and imaginary numbers. So numbers as a whole, there's one big dividing line that slices the entire collection of numbers, and that is the separation between real numbers and imaginary numbers. Now, if you've never heard of an imaginary number, it sounds like a rather silly concept. Like, how can a number that is imaginary, which is you know up here in my mind, exist? It's imaginary. It doesn't make any sense, I guess. Um, but I can show you where imaginary numbers come from and why they're so different from real numbers. So let's get started. And I'm going to switch here to the overhead and describe to you the difference between real and imaginary. Now, within the set of real numbers, there's also a breakdown. There are different kind of real numbers, too. So we'll go through that as well. So this is section C1. So if you look at a big set of numbers, there's a whole bunch of numbers out there. Any number you can possibly think of lives in here. So we're going to say that every number that is possibly created will reside in this set. Notice I've started with some pretty simple numbers. But let's try a few more over here. Let's put in a 12 over 7. Let's try that. Let's put in a square root of 2. I'll put that over there. How about a square root of 100? I'll put that right over there. Uh, no set of numbers would be complete without zero. That's an important number. And over here, I'm going to put the square root of minus 1 and even the square root of minus 2. Well, right away, there is a separation. The separation is right here. These numbers over here just simply don't exist in the real world. You're not going to find them on a ruler. You're not going to find them on a number line. Um, a computer is not going to be very happy about those numbers, and neither is your calculator generally, although some of these more advanced calculators know what to do with those numbers. So those are called imaginary numbers. And the reason they're imaginary is because this is saying the square root of minus 1 and it actually says, what number would you square to produce a minus 1? Well, let's try a few. I would square the number 1, and I would get a 1 back. Nope. What number would I square to get minus 1? That didn't work. How about squaring the number minus 1 itself and getting a minus 1 back? It's just not happening. So what number would you square to get that number? There is no such number that you can square. So we're going to call this the set of imaginary numbers because they only really reside in our minds. They're not real. There is no answer to that. In fact, mathematicians have given this particular nasty little square root its own name, i, for the imaginary unit. Now over here, these are all real numbers. They really do exist. These are real over here. But within the set of real numbers, there's, there's some subsets. For example, probably the smallest little subset would be this guy right here. And I would call this either the natural numbers or the counting numbers. If we include the zero, like this, that's a set as well, and we call this the set of whole numbers. 
It's basically all the natural or counting numbers, including uh, the zero. So you don't really use zero for counting. So if I were to count the number of students in the class, I would say, well, I would count, let's say, people who are seated in the class, one, two, three, four, five, but I don't start at zero. So zero is included in the whole numbers. Uh, finally, uh, another circle here that we can place right around here. And this would really be the set of integers. Now, integers include both positive and negative numbers, but certainly you'll notice something about integers. Integers aren't really fractions. Integers are numbers that don't really have any decimal component either. So they're pretty clean numbers, but you can have positive integers, you can have negative integers, and zero also represents an integer. Then we start getting into these guys here, this fraction here. Now, hopefully you've caught me in the fact that I've made a little mistake here. Because the square root of 100, even though it's a square root, is actually worth 10. And 10 is an integer. So that shouldn't be outside like that. Square root of 100 lives in here. Square root of 100, which is equal to 10. So that should have been placed inside the counting numbers. So even though it wasn't expressed as a 10, square root of 100 can be written as a 10. So there it is right inside there now. It's really 10 and belongs inside. Now, over here, I've got other numbers like minus 13 fifths and two-thirds and negative one-half. We can draw one more circle all the way around here and include those. And this right here is the set of rational numbers. So rational numbers, if I zoom in, are any number that can be written as a fraction. So let's look at all these numbers. Can these numbers be written as fractions? Well, of course they can. These are already fractions. That's already a fraction. That's already a fraction. So is that. Can 1 and 2 and 3 be written as fractions? Certainly. We can write 1 as 1 over 1. We can write 3 as 3 over 1. Can I write square root of 100 as a fraction? Sure I can. 10 over 1 or 20 over 2. And so can these over here. But I'm afraid this number over here cannot be written as a fraction of an integer divided by an integer. Neither can this. And neither can this. So this is over here, this is the set of irrational numbers. Now I really like the words rational and irrational, by the way. It doesn't mean what you think it means. Rational and irrational sometimes referred to as a thinking process. You know, that's a rational thought. That makes sense. It's an irrational thought. It doesn't make sense. In this case, the word ratio is built into to rational and irrational. And ratio means fraction. Okay, ratio in mathematics means a fraction. So these are irrational, cannot be written as a fraction. Now there is a very identifiable method for discerning whether a number is rational or irrational. Take a look at a couple of these numbers here. Pi, for example, is 3.14159265. It goes on and on and on, never terminates. Square root of 2 it's approximately 1.414, and it never terminates. It goes on and on and on. E is roughly 2.71828, and it goes on and on and on. So here's the deal. Irrational numbers, the decimal portion always goes on forever, and it's non-repeating. It doesn't repeat. So what about rational numbers? Let's take a look at a few of the rational numbers. How about the number 2? Terminates. So the decimal terminates in that case. How about the number 1 half? Terminates. So the decimal seems to terminate when you have a rational number. Except when you get to 2 thirds, something else happens. 
Now, when you get to a number like two-thirds, you'll find that it doesn't terminate. but repeats forever and ever and ever. So it's repeating. Now, it doesn't mean that the entire decimal has to repeat, just a portion of it. So I'm looking for some examples here where just a portion of that decimal repeats. Found one, 3 over 7. 3 over 7 is worth 0 0.428571. Wouldn't you say that kind of looks like an irrational number? It looks like a random collection, and it does go on, except 4, 2, 8, 5, 7, 1, and it keeps going. Now, to represent that it keeps going, we put a little bar over it like that. So that's irrational numbers. Okay, I'm sorry, that's a rational number. Rational means a fraction, means either terminating or repeating, one or the other. Okay, so let's take a look at the real number line. And the real number line is the way to represent numbers, real numbers, graphically. Let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna draw a real number line and I'm going to do so using a straight edge here, and I highly recommend that you also have a ruler or a straight edge so that you can do this. And the real number line, there are no imaginary numbers on here, but the real number line goes on forever and ever in each direction. And you want to mark off the integers here. So 0, 1, 2, 3. That does not mean that this real number line stops at 4. It does go on forever, and that's what this arrow means. Um, equally space out some integers here at negative 1 and negative 2. And ran out of room, so negative 3 is fine. It does go on forever in each direction. Now, on this real number line, there's every real number on here, rational and irrational. Let's find a few. Starting with this first one here, this is the number 1. 1, and that is a rational number. It's also an integer, it's also a counting number, it's also a whole number. Check this one out right here. That's pi. That's 3.14159, it goes on forever, and that one happens to be irrational. So the number line doesn't discriminate, it accepts both rational and irrational numbers. Now let's talk about the order in which these numbers appear. You would say that 1 is smaller than pi. And the way we want to say that mathematically is with the less than symbol. Makes it a lot easier to write the less than symbol than is smaller than. And I want you to notice something when we use this inequality symbol. Do you notice that it always points to the smaller number? So in this case, 1 is less than pi, which is true. Um, and the arrow is actually pointing at the smaller number. We want to write inequalities that are true. So we could check this one off and say, true it is. We could also reverse that process. If I put pi here and I put 1 here, I would have to put the arrow this way. Because this one means is less than, and this one means is greater than. However, you'll notice that it still points to the smaller number. So inequality symbols, pretty straightforward, less than, greater than. Um, just make sure that the arrow points to the smaller number. Now, just like I could say something in English that wasn't true, I could lie, in fact. We could do that mathematically, too, but we want to try to avoid that. So I could say that 2 is greater than 3, but that's false. So I could write it down, but I'd really like to cross that off um, as quickly as possible. Okay, so we've talked about the real number line. We've talked about 
inequalities. And I also want to discuss order. So we'll finish up with that. In addition to the inequality symbols greater than and less than, we also have greater than or equal to, less than or equal to. And let's put down a few true statements here. So we could say that 2 is less than or equal to 3. Check. 3 is less than or equal to 3. See, it can be equal. In fact, it's pretty cool. You can just cover this up, and it says right there, 3 equals 3. Yes, it is. Check it off. We could say that 4 is greater than or equal to minus 1, and we could also say that 4 is greater than or equal to 4. All completely true, okay? But we don't want to do this. So we're trying to avoid these false statements. So let's avoid doing that. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about are using the inequality symbols to solve an inequality. We're solving an inequality when there's an unknown involved. So far, we haven't had unknowns. They're just numbers. You'll notice that smaller numbers are on the left of the number line. Larger numbers are on the right. The arrow always points to the smaller number in the inequality for the statement to be true. So I want you to check the next section, which is uh, well, still section C1, but the next video will be solving inequalities and using the different methods of expressing your answer, one of which is interval notation, and that might be new for you. So tune in to the next video. We'll see you shortly.